Good afternoon. We are pleased to have you join us uh, for our relevant conversation on redefining and reimagining the dual enrollment college and career pathways. My name is Dwayne McClary. I'm the Senior Director of Networks and Partnerships at Digital Promise. Digital Promise is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, independent 501c3 that shapes the future of learning and advances equity educational systems by bringing together research, technology, and networks of practitioners. We are positioned at the intersection of educators, entrepreneurs, and researchers. Digital Promise identifies, develops, and promotes strategies to improve all levels of education and provide all learners, especially those that have been historically excluded, with the knowledge and skills needed to compete in a global economy. Dual enrollment helps millions of high school students uh, get on the path for career and career preparedness every year. Nationally, 82% of public high schools offer dual enrollment courses, mostly in partnership with community colleges. As a result, uh, it results in dual enrollment has been a great potential to reduce the equity gaps by race and family income in college going and degree attainment. Yet rather than advancing equitable college access and success, the conventional approach to dual enrollment trends to reinforce inequities in high school and college transitions. In fact, four of every five school districts have racial equity gaps to access to dual enrollment. So our purpose today in today's session is to examine innovative solutions that are lowering the barriers to higher education, including dual enrollment. To begin, we have a few housekeeping orders. I uh, just wanted to bring it to your attention. First and foremost, all attendees will be on mute throughout this uh, opportunity in this webinar. Please let us know what you have already done, but those of you who are just joining us, let us know where you're coming, where you're joining us from. Drop your name, your location, and your organization in the chat. If you hear anything that resonates with you, please feel free to share uh, applause or even put something in the chat that, you know what, that sounds right, that makes sense to me. But also, if you have any questions or concerns, please drop your questions in the Q&A button at the lower right corner of the screen. For the first 15 minutes of this uh, panel, our panelists will share insights on dual enrollment in college and career pathways. In the last 15 minutes, we will shift to a town hall Q&A. And we invite you, our audience, to drop your questions in the Q&A options. Uh, to say, to welcome our panelists, I would like to welcome uh, our fearless leader at Digital Promise, uh, Mr. Jean-Claude Brizard. He's the president and CEO of Digital Promise and Brett Roa. How, he's also a member, a great partner at Digital Promise, one of our uh, partners for uh, some of our great work that's going on with the districts. He is the high school strategic partnership leader at Outlier. Welcome, gentlemen. Great. Good morning. Afternoon. Good, Thank good. Thank you so much for having us. So quickly to begin, tell us where you're joining us from and um, a little bit about your organization. I think, John claude I kind of covered a little bit about digital problems, <laughs> but I hope I didn't steal your thunder, but we'll, we'll start with you, John claude no, it's obviously where, where I'm from. I'm calling in right now from Northern California, in the Bay Area, um, but I've lived in many places across across the country, so happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you. Brett? Hi, I'm joining from New York um, on behalf of Outlier.org, and just the briefest overview, our mission at Outlier.org is to increase access to high-quality education, address inequities, and reduce the overall student debt crisis. Awesome. So before we begin, we have a, a quick video we wanted to kind of share with you guys to kind of open up the dialogue and conversation uh, to give you a little bit of context of, of the reason why we're here. So bear with me and I'll share this video with you. One second. There we go. At the intersection of logic, art, and magic, we find computer science the force that powers our daily lives. Those who master its spells will open doorways to the future. Code lies at the heart of everything that powers our modern life. In this course, Wait, we'll begin to I've demystify the, the magic that moves ones and zeros around the globe in the blink of an eye. 
using Java, the language of this class. One second. Having some bandwidth issues here. Here we go. How about now? At the intersection of logic, art, and magic, we find computer science, the force that powers our daily lives. Those who master its spells will open doorways to the future. Code lies at the heart of everything that powers our modern life. In this course, we'll begin to demystify the magic that moves ones and zeros around the globe in the blink of an eye. Using Java, the language of this class, you'll learn not only how to train your mind to solve both digital and non-digital problems, but you'll also begin to learn the very practical and marketable skill of programming. Computer science is magic. Computer science allows us to build whatever we want. And through our custom interface, you'll be able to code with us. I want to write a program to track my cat's diet. I love it. I'm going to show you what's called a two-dimensional array using a game of tic-tac-toe. The ability to build your own universe is magical. Computer science has been for a long time very closed. The larger and more diverse group of computer scientists can only enrich the field. Computer science is accessible, it's approachable. Once you get into this field, the possibilities really are endless. Welcome to Computer Science One. Let's get started. Let's get started. Let's get started. Let's get started. All righty. John Claude, we're mm. going to start up with you. Yes, sir. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you so very much. That video is so exciting to to watch, Brett, on on so many so many levels. Um, I was telling Brett that I showed this to my twelve and ten year old last night, and they were really excited because of taking coding classes. But you know, uh, I have to tell you, as a uh, chemistry major when I was an undergrad, uh, I quickly learned had to learn how to code a bit uh, to solve some of the uh, challenging math problems that I actually had in advanced math, advanced um, um, in advanced calculus, and for, of course in in, in my in my uh, chemistry classes. So thank you for for showing that particular video. One of the things we do here at Digital Promise is talk quite a bit about this idea of computational thinking pathways. So I think while the video, for example, shows a lot about coding, we know that kind of thinking, that kind of work really belongs in every single subject area um, that kids think I should take in school. So what you see in front of you, uh, just, just sort of pull us back a little bit, the broader picture as to why this discussion, I think is really critical and important uh, is, is the fact that we talk about redefining success often in schools for a very long time math proficiency reading proficiency um, has been the goal in so many places what we push very very bluntly is that that is a means to an end it is not the end means yes we expect kids to know how to read yes we expect them to know how to add uh, and, and be able to do all the stuff we, we, we want in the academics but the definition of success is broader than that it really is about economic security it's about well-being it's about uh, agency, uh, lifelong agency. But to get there, we do know that young people have to have some form of post-secondary experience. And what you see in front of you as one example in one state in the Pacific Northwest, and by the way, we can draw a similar graph for just about any state in the country, that the attrition of students along the pathway is quite stunning. So when you look at this particular slide, you see for all students in this particular state, only 25% get a post-secondary degree, two and four year. And if you were to wrap around, uh, next slide please, Dwayne, if you were to wrap around an equity lens to this in this particular state, you can see that the issues are even more stunning. It's about 13% of kids getting that. The big headline here as well is the fact that most Americans, again, brown, black, or white, uh, poor, the, the entire population, the largest sec section sector of the American public has some college, which means that if enrolling college, uh, the, the line from the community college center at Columbia University is that they wander in, they wander around, then they wander out. Uh, the fact is that we lose a lot of people who come in uh, to Brett's earlier push, um, amass a great amount of debt, but do not get a credential at the end of it. So. 
one of the things I push on my team is I think how do we change this narrative that you see in front of you? It's not just about the progression, it's also about the transition points that you see along, along the way. Um, the fact is that we're making progress and you can see this from the last, uh, from one of the census publications that we have more and more people getting a post-secondary degree. So there's good news there. Uh, and the fact that from 2001 to 2021, last 20 years, we are making progress and more folks actually going in and completing a, a post-secondary degree. But there's a story behind this. Um, when you look at this, first of all, um, again, picking on Washington State, uh, I mean, I work at the Gates Foundation for, for a number of years and Washington State was a big part of my portfolio. When you look at this though nationally, that is variation among states um, and young people um, uh, going in actually uh, are matriculating and even persisting in, in college, uh, quite a variation. If you go to the next slide, Wayne. The variation actually is, as you can imagine, much more pronounced when you look at the underserved, or as Dwayne said, the historically and systematically excluded populations. Um, we're doing okay when it comes to Asian students, but again, there's nothing to write home about here for anybody. We're doing okay for Asian students. We're doing somewhat okay for white, for the Hispanic white students. But when you look at the black and Hispanic population, we're not doing so well. And I bet if we had indigenous populations listed here, the numbers would even be lower. The fact is that uh, while we have made progress uh, in the last uh, 20 years, the gap is still exists. One thing I would love for us to talk about later on is that we are trying to solve for the access gap. We also have to solve for the success gap as well too. As you can see here, the gaps are pretty pronounced. Last slide for me. So as you can imagine, one of the things that uh, we push at Digital Promise are three North Star goals. So this idea on the far right of young people getting access to a post-secondary uh, credential that offers economic security, well-being and agency, as well as in the middle box, we talk about the pathway for getting there. Again, it's not just about the end goal of credentialing post-secondary, is how do we think about the P, the 16 P to W, pre-K to workforce, pre-K to college completion pathway, making sure that we are not getting the kinds of attrition you saw in the first slide. And last thing, of course, we do quite a bit here is to make sure that all the tools and solutions that we procure, that we create both from our own work and in partnership with groups like, um, um, like Outlier is to make sure those kinds of tools and solutions are making its way into the water system, making its way to the practitioners that we have here in, in the audience. With that, um, toss it back to you, Wayne. Thank you, John claude Thank you for sharing those perspective and those, those numbers. We've come a long way, but we have a lot more to do. And, and thank you for your commitment to taking on these challenges and supporting these students. Um, to, to no end, like I think your leadership has really helped us take a visual at how do we really take a microscope um, to even look at how we can do better for these students. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm gonna switch over to you, Brett, um, to kind of share a little bit about Outlier, but also to also kind of share a personal story about why this work is important to you as an educator. Yeah, thank you, Dwayne. And again, John claude thank you. It's really an honor um, to be here today with your amazing organization, getting to share what really is the most important um, issue to me as an educator. So after 16 years in public education in the New York City Department of Ed, uh, I transitioned to supporting the work at outlier.org. And so my why in all of this in making sure students do have access to the highest quality education and reduce student debt really started in my first few years as, as an educator. Uh, I coincidentally, my high school classroom in Brooklyn at Automotive, a CTE school, was located directly across the hall from the college office. And so I know today we're going to talk a lot about access and equity. I'm going to start with inaccess and inequity. The door was always locked. Students just straight up were not given access to the door, the most important, in my opinion, uh, room in high school. It's the pathway and it's your why and it's helping students forge their next path after graduation. And many students, when finding themselves locked out of that room, would come to my classroom after school and ask me a lot of questions that I was probably ill-equipped to handle at that time. Uh, financial aid, what's the best college? But I immediately recognized this was my calling, uh, just listening, trying to figure out why they were experiencing issues beyond just the inaccess to our trained college team. And it made me find the courage to speak with our high school principal and say, you know, I know I'm not trained in this field, but I think if you give me access to supporting our students, we can really have some transformative impact. And I'm really blessed that I had a very courageous leader who saw this and addressed it. 
and um, allowed me to really make this my calling in passion and education. So starting from there, allowing uh, the opportunity to build some really model programs around four-year advisory programs in the high school space for the New York City Department of Education's College Access for All program. And then transitioning to being a turnaround principal just led me to keep seeing the more access and opportunities you can provide students at the earliest possible ages, especially access to high quality educators and educational solutions um, and making sure they feel they belong on a college campus if that's what they want. Um, that's my why and that's what led me to outlier.org's like, uh, mission, increasing access to high quality education, reducing student debt and making sure that students across the country and the world have access to the best instructors, the best educational platforms and you know, really successful outcomes that mirror in-person college class completion rates, which is unprecedented in online education. Thank you, Brett. Thanks for sharing that. So yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through you, let you go through your slides and talk a little bit about the degrees plus. Absolutely, thank you. So outlier.org uh, was founded with dual enrollment courses that in the high school space would allow students to earn up to three credits from the University of Pittsburgh. And we're so proud of that. Um, high quality partnership with the top 50 globally ranked institution because it does allow our students to transfer these credits almost universally to any uh, post-secondary institution, including Ivy Leagues and including those that might be right in their backyard like a local community college. So when we talk about addressing inequity, that's one issue. And as John Claude already addressed, um, many students have started college in this country um, after they graduate high school. It's that perseverance and success through college that outliers are really hoping to address and some of the key issues that they have been challenged with specifically around the cost, um, access to high quality institutions and making sure that there's a pathway for upon graduation. So we're really proud of the fact that in 2022, we launched Degrees Plus. This allows us in our partnership with Golden Gate University to have students earn an accredited college associate's degree uh, from Golden Gate in three different pathways. And equally as important, earning a career certificate that's allowing them to demonstrate their knowledge of in-demand skills um, from some of the companies you see here like Google, Meta, and IBM. And again, it goes back to that why. So many students I saw had to make really difficult life decisions at a very young age. So they might've said, I wanna pursue a technical career certificate. That came at a, you know exorbitant cost that might put themselves or their families in massive debt. And didn't have potentially the highest successful outcomes. Similar, similarly, students might decide at a very young age that they want to pursue the college pathway. What I'm so proud of at outlier.org is that we've merged those. Students are leaving with these industry-ready credentials, a college degree, and if they persevere on a full-time basis, can earn those in under 20 months. But the most important thing for us is that not only are they earning this, they're earning this at a cost um, that allows 56% of eligible Americans to be fully funded the Degrees Plus program by the Pell Grant. So we're addressing that inequity and we're really de-risking the process of taking that next step into a college campus. And in this case, not just a college campus through Degrees Plus, but also um, learning about industry standards that you might be passionate about pursuing. Thank you for that, Brett. And it's very important that you, what you're sharing, shedding a light on here for folks. Uh, because a lot of folks think when we talk about dual enrollment, it's only for college bound students. It's, you know, it's not even, it's not that it's also for kids preparing them for, you know, if they're going to the workforce, helping them be more prepared with certification, certifications and certificates. I, I would say personally, um, when I was in uh, high school in South Carolina, our community college was right next door to our high school, which was fortunate to, for me. Uh, I went and I was able to take courses there. So when I went to college, I was like, two semesters ahead, almost a year ahead of where I should have been. And it saved my mother a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, it saved us a lot of money so that I could get a jump start um, yeah. on, to, on my uh, opportunities. Yeah. And just to just to highlight, so in speaking about Degrees Plus specifically, you know, obviously this is a great opportunity to the college counselors and, and the post-secondary folks in the room. This is another pathway, right? This is an opportunity to earn an online degree an incredibly low cost but that also provides you that career certificate. But we also are working with folks who are returning to college, addressing that uh, high percentage that Jean-Claude referenced earlier. And in part of my role at Outlier, I have been doing extensive outreach to interested prospective Degrees Plus students who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s. And one story that really resonated with me was this uh, young man from Iowa. And 
you'd be so surprised at how quickly folks open up and explain their journey from like upon graduating high school to why they're picking up a phone call about degrees plus. And I just kept finding myself wishing that students had access to this or access to other similar opportunities because so much of their journey um, was unnecessary, right? Not only the financial burden that they had to take on, but also the, in many cases, the subpar learning outcomes. Many of them described their hopes and dreams uh, of why they chose the pathway they chose. And it's just not really aligning with their current situations and reality. And again, just highlights the inequity and inaccess to, uh, to many of the quality opportunities that we're hoping to solve in partnerships with you know, organizations such as Digital Promise in highlighting this uh, amazing opportunity in Degrees Plus. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're gonna shift quickly um, now to the Q&A portion of this webinar. So I invite you, our audience, uh, if you would, if you have a question for the panelists, we invite you to drop it in the Q&A feature on the webinar, it's on the bottom right. Um, and you can drop that in the Q&A option and we will answer your questions. But in the meantime, as those questions come in, I do have a question for you, uh, gentlemen. Um, let's talk about, first and foremost, some of you, you hit on this a little bit, but I want you to go a little bit deeper on, on this. How would you describe the why behind students and family choosing uh, dual enrollment? And it can come from your personal story or it can come from your organization. Like, what is your why? And I'll start with you, John claude Wayne, that, I think I think it's a great it's a great question. So I, I got so many answers to this to this push, but let me start first of all uh, with what Brett outlined in terms of um, um, thinking about the dual enrollment career pathways, etc. It goes back to this idea that so many young people walk into or wander into college, they wander around, they wander out. One thing that we have learned from the research is that if young people walk into high school with a six year plan. Uh, or throughout high school, develop a plan that goes beyond high school, the chance of persisting is that much higher, right? Uh, the purpose, I think, is, is there in them understanding what that, what that is, which is why I think when you think about that kind of long view is critical. The second of why I think dual women is so critical, and I spent some time at the college board, and I can tell you, we saw, that, we saw in the data as well, that young people will get access to, we call access to rigor. So access to dual enrollment, access to AP, right? What, what they get is a view of what college courses look like and feel like, and they begin to believe I can do this, right? Uh, there's recent data that shows that even if a child, for example, in, in the kid of the college board, even get a one on the exam, their chance of going to college and persisting is that much higher than any child was that even exposed to it. So dual enrollment, which I know is, um, is common across the country, Often, though, we, we think about the rigor being uneven, which is why I think what Outla is doing with top class universities really is, is, is important here in terms of making sure that the rigor is there. Uh, at the same time, you think about the credential that comes with that too. That's also important, not just the college credit. But the bottom line is just the access and the experience of being in a dual enrollment class really provides a kind of mindset that I can and will succeed when I get to college. And you'll find in the data that those young people or accessing post secondary at a much greater rate than the kids who are not getting access to this kind of experience. Thanks, John Claude. Brett? Yeah, so first, in thinking about why this is so important to students and families, um, I often think of a term that, unfortunately, I'm sure many educators have heard students saying college isn't for me. Um, I think that's just rooted in you know, inequity, implicit bias that's just been instilled in so many young people. Um, so one of the key things that made me a real champion of dual enrollment, both, you know, previously in serving as a principal, bringing, you know, college level courses, fostering partnerships with the local community colleges is you decide if college is right for you, not your family's mindset, not even societal um, or cultural expectations of you based on who you are, not your teachers. And, you know, it's really important that you have given yourself the opportunity to engage in this work because it is totally acceptable. It's perfect if you've given this an authentic opportunity and decided the next step in my pathway is career credentials, is the armed forces, is any other pathway that's well thought out, but it's that you've given yourself the opportunity to not be uh, labeled by society in a way that makes you feel less than. Um, I think also what's really important for me is with outlier.org is that quality, right? So access is a step one, but quality as Jean-Claude brought up, it's 
it's uh, it's uneven at best. So yeah. some of the partnerships I've had with local community colleges have been wonderful, but oftentimes you're not um, able to make sure that that um, educator in the room has you know the uh, the skill set to work with your specific demographic of students in your population. Um, they also might just not have access to those courses that your students are most hopeful for, um, just based on so many other constraints outside of that professor's hands. So for me, uh, that has always been one of the most amazing things about the outlier experience is the high level of quality, access to the best professors um, you know, in the world. You're taking your calculus one course from multiple professors, including uh, John Urschel from MIT. Mm -hmm. And the fact that regardless of your geography and socioeconomic background, that access is there and that quality uh, and rigor is there in perpetuity, regardless of other changes, um, you know, in uh, staffing and other nature. Yeah, so, it's so yeah. important to me. So I have a two part question for you. Uh, one thing that I've always been impressed by Digital Promises Reach, uh, we have some questions from uh, the continent of Africa. Uh, so the first question is, can students from the African content continent participate? And then also, uh, do you see Africa getting any leverage in this as far as computer science concerned? So two part question, I'll open it up to, to both of you. Why don't you go first with Outlier? Absolutely, sure. Um, well, regarding Outlier, yes, we have students from across the world who engage in Outlier courses. Um, we're very, you know, we're very proud of the fact that we are open access. And again, speaking of access, you know, so many students have given us uh, that feedback that many uh, one day hope to attend either uh, American colleges or universities. Many have also explained the uh, game changer it is, even if they were to remain in their uh, native country, but earn an accredited American um, college career, uh, college degree, such as our uh, Degrees Plus program and those certificates. So, you know, we really embrace uh, international students as well, and that would be fantastic. And in terms of specifically around computer science, um, again, we know that that is a door opener, a game changer, and, you know, there's so many initiatives like CEOs for CS, computer science for all initiatives uh, in the United States, and trying to make that a graduation requirement here. We obviously hope that becomes, you know, a global initiative um, in all areas of the world, including Africa. And I just add that um, what makes what makes the online portion of this great is that it really is accessible. We know, for example, during a pandemic, we saw a lot of online courses, extended courses being offered to young people um, um, across the U.S. and across the world. Um, if this was an in-person program, it would make it that much more difficult to access, but because it is yeah. virtual, it really allows for that kind of participation. Uh, I know, for example, I, I was at Harvard uh, a few months ago, their online master's program went to like 18,000 across the world in, in over, overnight during the pandemic because of that kind of online access. So it does provide for that. The other thing I would say too, in addition to just a computer science degree, a computer science course, I really want to keep coming back to this idea of computational thinking pathways, right? Because when you look at this, you don't have to become a coder, you don't have to become a systems engineer, um, but you can think about how those skills integrate into the fabric of the core curriculum. And by the way, it's amazing districts. Uh, I mean, when you know this Talladega County in Alabama doing this kind of work, and there are others around the country doing CT computational thinking pathways, and I can put an article in the, in the chat soon. Um, just just that kind of access and thinking. And I think I've said this. I have twelve credits in, in coding when I was an undergrad. Um, uh, student, but I was a chemistry major. What was I doing taking coding classes? But that kind of experience taught me how to think, um, taught me the role of, 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 of technology in what I do. But CT Pathways in general teaches things like pattern recognition. Um, can you look at data and make sense of it, right? So that belongs in English, it belongs in social studies, it belongs to math, it belongs in science courses. So you can integrate these skills across the board. But by the line, going back to the uh, question on access and just the online portion of this just makes this that much more accessible yeah yeah so there, there are some specific questions for you brett um yeah. especially because i know there's a lot of leaders here that want to kind of how do they turn this on next day yeah. um, they want to run with it so question around high school students how do how do high school students take these courses do they take it at a local college or do they uh, work with outlier to allow them um between you know two-year degrees or certifications or career certs, 
And then the other question is, uh, how do students uh, fund this? Or you, you mentioned, you know, the PEL grants. Yeah, great question. So first of all, we, we do work with partners nationwide. We work with districts, charters, um, and educational access networks to provide access to outlier college level courses while students are in high school. So it is so important to us that we do find uh, partners in this. The partners have uh, traditionally been the funders of these courses for high school level students to earn those dual enrollment uh, opportunities. Um, when we work with those partners, we work hand in hand, we work extensively. Uh, myself and our partnerships team, you know, I use my background as a former programmer, college career advisor, administrator, to make sure that academic requirements are met and policies within your state. Um, we review those in depth with you because for many, um, for many partners, this is their first opportunity to work with an online, uh, online uh, dual enrollment provider. And we know historically there are opportunities, you know, as we've said, the, the highlight remains, many students have access to dual enrollment opportunities. We're trying to provide another high quality solution for your students uh, and finding partners that recognize that what they've been doing with students traditionally helps some, we're trying to help the others. Um, in addition that, to that question though, um, when we do work with partners, one thing that I've thoroughly enjoyed is our partners are, you know, we are in continue, uh, continual refinement process of improvement. So we look at what's working in your school. So we have some partners who just, for example, have a really robust STEM program, which is terrific. Um, and we always are trying to figure out ways to complement the great work you're already doing that align with your mission and vision. And hopefully you're getting feedback from your students and families of what courses uh, have you not yet offered or they would like access to. And that's where Outlier really finds yourself a partner in the K-12 space of listening, um, trying to provide those high level programs and making sure it embeds directly into your school day or before or after school and just complements the great work that uh, you're already doing with your students to just provide, again, more opportunities to high quality educational uh, solutions. I think I had to relate to that. And I yeah, think maybe, please. but uh, please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right about, about this for outlier. And there's a couple of questions looking at Dana's question in the chat, or and it was another question about bandwidth mm. and, and kids. Uh, and I'll speak from uh, uh, from the position of a former dual enrollment teacher uh, to a dual enrollment principal, and of course as a superintendent in Rochester, New York, and in Chicago. One of the things that is great about partnering with, with an organization like Outlier is the, in the idea of dual enrollment is they're getting high school credit and college credit at the same time, right? But when you are not adding to the school day, but replacing, that makes sense, right? So when my kids, for example, took a science class that was at the college level, they got a high school credit for it because the laws in New York allowed, for example, if the class is more rigorous, but meets the standards of the state, you can replace the high school credit. So yeah. you're not adding more to the kids' day. Yes, the course is a bit more rigorous, uh, but you're not adding more to the school day. I also want to address one piece in the chat too here about this idea of holistic supports. Um, that does not take away the need to support young people uh, in a way that provides for them to get to uh, experience this. Uh, we know in dealing especially with poor kids that the academic support is important, but it's all, also the social emotional support that's important. And frankly, how do you leverage a greater community really better supporting uh, young people as they get access to these kinds of, of coursework. But the goal again is not to add another layer to the school day, but to provide a kind of dual access, dual enrollment that gives kids that kind of visibility into the rigor, into the college, and at the same time get a credential that puts them an advanced standing way to your to your point earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, can I just add on to that? Yeah, That's really please. important. Um, a great clarifying point, John Claude. I just want to highlight, um, you know, outliers found the best levels of success with our partners when you do it exactly that you know dual enrollment is not an add-on it doesn't mean give students a full schedule but by working together with partners we find where we have alignment with your current graduation requirements or other state standards that you're you know accountable for to make sure that this supplants something else allowing students enough time to focus on a truly rigorous course and that's something um we continue to get partner feedback on this is rigorous these are this is a top 50 globally ranked institution awarding these credits um so we work very hard to provide that equitable service to students. You know, we have a student support team to support both you, the educator, and the students. Um, we have community platforms for discussion. And we also provide unlimited math and writing tutoring and office hours with subject matter experts. So 
we don't say here's outlier good luck it's actually much more important to us that we're saying we are a partner in your students success and outcomes and we are always going to continue to find the best leverage points for you to to bring access to these courses to your students and already utilize the frameworks you have that are working yeah so both of you hit on something we talked about in the beginning equity how do we ensure equitable uh, approaches and equitable access for these students because as you know we we went through a pandemic we we dealt with the internet capability and inequities a lot of districts have answered that question but there's still a lot out there but there's more equity issues um, than just connectivity here that's going on how do we ensure that students um, who don't have access to these courses now how do we develop ways or what are some tips you could give the districts out there that's that's listening to this our partners and either of you can jump in yeah but i'm happy to start on this you want to you want to start on this one sure um so i think step one it goes it continues to go back to there's just so many students who have been underserved by so many barriers um one thing that's really important to us is that outliers completely open access um in being a dual enrollment partner with local community colleges, there are a lot of barriers to entry. Sometimes it's GPA based or state standardized tests or PSAT or SAT scores. Mm -hmm. And I understand why those are in place um, and why that mindset would exist. And yet it's just one that I personally and then outlier as an organization, that's just not our mission. Our mission is to find those students who as upperclassmen, 11, 12th graders, who are now ready for the challenges and rigors and who maybe have you know, had life uh, situations that put them in a place where their GPA or standardized test scores aren't reflective of their current passion and uh, preparedness, we're, we're hyper-focused on allowing the schools to choose the students they want to provide this opportunity to. Um, in addition, so many students probably don't in intrinsically feel like they deserve the best possible education in the world, right? That's just never been something that's been explicitly shared with them and society has probably given them a different uh, internal mindset, unfortunately. So one thing we're so proud of is you literally can say to your students, these are the top professors from the top institutions in the world, the schools you may want your students to one day attend. Um, and there's no geographic or socioeconomic barriers to that, which again, traditionally have been the case when we talk about the absolute top institutions in the world. And then the last thing I just want to say is students want to see people and feel like they belong in the space of higher ed. And so representation really matters to us. Um, approximately 40% of our instructors self-identify as a person of color. That's twice the national average. And approximately 50% uh, of our instructors identify as female, self-identify as female. Um, one of our, I'm just going to share a shout out, one of our amazing, one of many amazing professors is Kelly Richmond Pope. Um, she created our Intro to Financial Accounting course. Um, you know, Kelly is a, a proud African-American woman. She literally is doing everything she can in working with higher education institutions, as well as the major financial uh, accounting institutions across the world to bring her course to students who typically are underrepresented by great proportions in the field of accounting because she knows if they can just see that someone like her not only can create their own course with Outlier, um, can make it incredibly captivating and high quality that they too can one day find themselves in those shoes of being a leader in a field accounting or otherwise. So that those are just some ways that I hope we are doing our part to address uh, you know, inequity uh, and bringing more access to higher educational and high quality tools to students while they're in high school. Just to add to that, I mean, I think, I think Brett said it really, really well in terms of we do in our part, right? I think the rest of the work belongs to the system. Um, so to Dwayne's push around the idea of access to powerful learning, powerful devices, and then we push quite hard at Digital Promise, that is a foundational solution. Like today, we just published a paper on digital equity. Um, and if you haven't seen it, please take a look at our site and you'll, you'll see it. But what it does is guide governors and superintendents, especially state superintendents, on how to spend the $65 billion that the Biden administration is pushing forward for infrastructure. Uh, we, we see, again, as access to device, access to, to broadband as a foundational solution. And Verizon, uh, one of our key partners, there's a lot of work around that with us in bringing that solution. The other, I mean, I'll lean back to my days as a superintendent, frankly, even as a principal, and Brett's former principal is somebody I, I, I know, 
Um, I mean, I'm sure after we got there, she began to push this idea of access to, to AP, access to the dual enrollment. As a principal, I think my first class, I had five kids in an AP class. You know what? I did it because I wanted to begin to, to, to bring that kind, of, that kind of work. But at the same time, when you think about often who gets access to dual enrollment in most districts, again, this is not for everybody, but in some cases, the kids who uh, had the highest GPAs, uh, mm -hmm. or perhaps who are the schools where the parents are pushing hard for this, and the kids who are in the poor schools often, or the kids who have a or struggling with GPA often get access to this. I think this is where I think teachers can push on the system, principals can push on the system, but frankly, systems leaders. And I know our league of, of innovative schools really change. They, they change that kind of. I mean, these are folks who are very progressive in what they do. They demonstrate. Yes, we think about equity all of the time. We think about making sure that every kid gets access to those kinds of courses. And, but again, what you do is you provide the support for them to actually be able to do that. When I was in Chicago as a superintendent, we noticed that, for example, IB was in, in, in dual enrollment were amazing platforms for kids to persist in, in the top two universities. Guess what? We doubled the number of IB courses uh, and dual enrollment across the city. Uh, and by the way, those, those, those schools and dual enrollment were in the poorest part of the city. Mm -hmm. um, that that was the way in which we play along equity, right? So the question of of, of, um, of getting kids access uh, to these courses is one thing. How do you ensure they're successful is a second layer of this work. And that comes back to pedagogical support for teachers, academic support for young people, um, social and emotional support for young people. But you've got to have that kind of systems view where you're looking at who's getting access who is being successful in the data right. that tells you where to begin to pour your, your, your resources. One last thing I'll say is that on this topic is I was, I was the head of high schools in New York City. I remember us doing studies uh, and looking at kids' potential. And we would go to places across New York City and say, hey, we're looking at the data, 2,000 of your kids qualify for this particular class, yet you have 40 kids in the class. Uh, can we help incentivize you to do this? And sometimes as a system, we paid half the cost um, in, in, in New York City, schools had autonomy. They had they had their own budgets. We say we'll pay half if you pay half, just to give your kids access. That kind of play, my point again, is to make sure that the system is supporting this push toward equity. Without that, I mean, I think teachers and principals are fighting the system. Um, but at the same time, I've seen teachers and principals change system, so it can be it can happen. Yeah. Can I just also bring up regarding access? Um, you know, not only is dual enrollment. I mean, the data shows it's already been proven in this in this uh, in this session that just having access has a transformative impact. But that also that next step about what access looks like when you're talking about the college application process. So again, small scale to big scale, we know how how valuable the individual time of each college counselor is with individualized students, and just having the ability to help them make a decision in a single session is again transformative in their lives. So. A few ways that we think about each clear step of the way is not only do our courses, if you take our dual enrollment courses with Outlier, they will, you know, transfer seamlessly into our Degrees Plus program. Um, we also make sure that our application takes under 15 minutes to complete. You can do it in a single sitting. Um, we also make sure we remove barriers around application fees. <clears throat> so, for example, we have a code that any participants today can share with their environment, uh, their with their community to have a free application fee, uh, everything waived by Degrees Plus. But more importantly, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, more importantly is that pathway. So for our students, upon completing a two-year associate's degree with those career certificates, they then also are guaranteed admission with a 2.5 GPA into Golden Gate University's bachelor's program. So it's always about preparing students for, here's why and here's what you can achieve in your very next step by achieving this step right now and always making sure it's so clear the goal and that there is a clear pathway and there are people there trying to shape that as we're trying to do in higher ed right now with Degrees Plus. Yeah, so one other question I see here is uh, for Brett, um, are there specific career tracks that you're tackling here and how are you ensuring that the courses that you're offering to students are preparing them for probably jobs that don't even exist yet, or possibly preparing them for, you know, the market that where there's a need. So could you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So <clears throat> again, something that the plus and degrees plus standing for those additional certificates you would earn at no additional cost by being part of this program. These are actually 
awarded the elective credits that make up your associate's degree. So students can actually bundle um, career certificate options in a number of different uh, industries. One, that we know are high demand based on the data. Two, 75% of students, 75% uh, of uh, career certificate recipients report career improvement within six months. Um, we know there's an increased demand for those skills. And so we are thinking really intentionally, not only finding industry leaders like Google, Meta, HubSpot, Salesforce, um, IBM, but what are the exact certificates? So students can do project management, cybersecurity, um, digital marketing, sales representative, sales operations. So we do have these aligned with our business administration, liberal studies and applied computing um, associates degree programs to make sure that yes, yeah, students, if they uh, persevere with outlier, not only to our degrees plus program, not only will they have that uh, associates degree in high demand fields, but also certificates that can be direct entry points, increase earnings and um, accelerate their pathway, especially if they're coming right out of high school. So we really hope to build that bridge. We're taking dual enrollment with us uh, and then um, transitioning seamlessly right into degrees plus would allow a student potentially a year and a half after they graduate high school to really be college and industry ready in specific high demand fields. Gotcha. So uh, last question, uh, how do we get our school counselors, high school counselors, um, one, understanding that there are options for uh, these dual credits and pathways? How do we get the access, get them that information? Uh, and secondly, is there any type of training or professional development you know of that can help them start thinking in that realm of how do we get students access to that for districts or schools that aren't even thinking in that realm? Mm. That's an excellent question. Is, um, I'll address it first and John Claude, if that's okay. Excellent. Okay. So I think opportunities like this. So if you are one of the, uh, whether it's a school leader or post secondary leader or school counselor that's here right now, um, just advocating, right? If you're recognizing that this is what your students lack, advocate, you know, reach out directly to Outlier, reach out directly to Digital Promise. Let's find out what the challenge is. And I think that's um, in getting to explore this work on a national scale and getting to attend conferences like the League of Innovative Schools and, you know, other really incredible coalitions. I think that is where there is a collective frustration, right? We all recognize this problem and we know there are solutions. So you know, being really intentional and about who you want to partner with, if this is the right fit and this addresses some of the challenges that you know your students are facing, again, whether it's access to high quality dual enrollment, access to uh, college and career pathways immediately upon graduating that's funded by the federal government at a very high value and low cost, partner with us, but also find those other, you know, um, other educational solutions. But you know, I, I hope there's just a collective sense of urgency in the United States after what we all just experienced around, you know, navigate this and advocate to make sure that you're bringing these tools to your students who need it urgently. Yeah. Jean-Claude, I got to, oh, you're, you're muted. There you go. Go for it. I got Sorry. a little different question for you, because I sure. know with the North Stars that we just came up with, one of them that I think really points to this is uh, the 30 million historically, you know, systematically excluded students for, you know, post-secondary completion. Um, what, what role does dual enrollment um, and career pathways play in that? Yeah, so Dwayne, it's, it's, it's a great question. So one, if you take a look at this idea of redefining success, that's a way of really signaling to the sector saying that we have to think bigger and broader because look, I have a, I'm a parent. I can tell you that I think that's how I think about my own children. Yes, I want them to, to be reading proficient, math proficient, but ultimately I want them to access post-secondary, then have a life of well-being, happiness, you know, et cetera, right? And economic security. So that's one of the ways we we, we push that. Uh, but I think go back to this idea of the 75% of the systems getting access to great tools. And this kind of webinar is one of the ways in which we do that, right? We produce a lot of amazing stuff. We have great partners and we have an amazing league of innovative schools. We tend to see them as the tip of the spear. We tend to see them as the multiplier. Um, so superintendents talk to superintendents. We also in, are talking about developing a principal's network. We already have a teacher's network called EdCamp. So in making sure that our folks understand the best in class 
so tools and solutions and making sure they become the multiplier to the sector is really, 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 really important as well too. So the way in which we think about this, by the way, 30 million represents the majority of public education students in America. That's what that number actually represents. What it means down the road for us in our global stance is a different set of conversations. But Dwayne, I also want to come back to, to uh, what Brett is talking about. So one is in the advocacy piece, understanding what the data tells us, right? I mean, this idea on dual enrollment in its advocacy is not new. We all know the power of that kind of access uh, to young people. Uh, but what we, what I find in my experience is that most systems leaders want to do this, often don't understand or don't know what exists. They may not be aware of outlier and what, what they're doing. So bringing the information back to the district, I think is an important way to do that. I would also say there's power in numbers. So if you're a teacher in this audience, you know, kind of hard by yourself to push on the system, but 15, 20 teachers or 15, 20 principals sitting now with the superintendent said, look, we saw this, we, we, we think this is an area of interest for us. Uh, we'd love to have a sit down with Brett or his team to think about how I'd like we could do this, um, where the funding exists within the system to support poor kids. Uh, all these become part of the conversations uh, or even invite Brett to his team to come speak to the leadership, I think is an important way to advocate for this. I can tell you when I walked into Chicago, I mean, the first few weeks, I got like 400 emails from teachers about a particular platform they wanted to go on uh, and move away from something else. Guess what? It was done in three or four months because we saw the demand. Uh, we went back and said, you guys really want to do this and we did this. Without that kind of advocacy, uh, I would never have known that this was a desire of the teaching staff. Um, so my point very simply is that there is strength in numbers, uh, sometimes it's just about getting information back to the leadership of a system. Because um, I know for a fact, again, I've, I've been a part of ASA, I've been a part of large systems. Um, I think I've never met a superintendent or principal say they don't want to do the right thing. They all want to do the right thing. Yeah. It's about getting information back to folks. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Getting connected to a network. I think that's the most yes. important thing John claude said. Doing connect. Can I give you one more? I'm sorry, just a couple of years. I just saw Eric, no, no, no. Eric pop up on, on the chat. Uh, Eric Ben here is, is, is a dear <laughs> friend. And I can tell you um, that sometimes you do have advocacy beyond the system. Eric runs a group called Economic Mobility Systems in Dallas, right? Uh, that used to be part of the Commit Partnership. Uh, Eric is all about uh, access to post-secondary. Everything he does is about influencing systems. To think, again, think long-term about success, but put the mechanics, uh, uh, lay the roadmap to actually getting there. Um, so sometimes it is a third party org like Eric Ben's organization that would say, let's bring Brett in and his team to sit with 10, 10 districts. Let's talk about how we integrate outline, what we actually do. So sometimes, yes, it is about direct uh, advocacy with the superintendent. Sometimes it's about leveraging people like Eric, Eric Ben to bring on a Brett um, to this kind of conversation. Yeah. And yeah. Can I just can I just mention you know just to to highlight um, you know we've we've definitely talked about students suffering through the pandemic and one thing I actually heard a League of Innovative uh, Schools convening was this idea that you know we have the opportunity now to transform education and yet we also know there's this inherent race to return to this normal and so many of the post secondary opportunities in dual enrollment are going to be, let's get back to tradition. But the data has shown with all this improvement we've had that the traditional current partnerships in place are not helping all students and are not helping a particular group of students who are gonna continue to be underserved and underrepresented unless we try to innovate and work collectively. So I think that is just one area that I hope as we continue this post pandemic surge in helping students uh, achieve some learning loss that we're one of the ways we're gonna continue to accelerate those numbers and students achieving those degrees and certificates that they hope for and deserve. Awesome, awesome. And, Thank you guys. And, and before before you, before you close, just one quick yeah. thing to Go add. Ahead. Ed's comment about uh, developing countries and making sure that we get the information. Uh, and we're called Digital Partners Global. We, we're taking that to heart and begin to push our work uh, uh, in much more globally. Um, in fact, we are right now doing some work on digital equity in Haiti, uh, building infrastructure, but we're talking digital learning gap work that we do, but know that this is a, a, one of our goals as well. And so thank you for pushing that suggestion. Yes, thank you 100%. Uh, as you guys have heard, you know this is a very important hot topic uh, conversation. 
Um, and if you don't take anything else here from here, but remember that one and most importantly, making sure you're doing right by students is most important, but also staying connected, like getting connected with folks. And as you can see, you know, we as K-12, we can't do this alone. You got to have partners like Digital Promise, partners like Outlier, you know, being accountable and stepping up to the plate to find ways to pretty much dismantle the way education was done and make a new new way. Uh, John Cloud, I'm going to add one thing uh, to what you said. You talked about the different networks, League of Innovative Schools, uh, Ed Camps, starting this principal network. Uh, we also have a student network we just started in March. So we're also hearing from students, like what do they want their education system to look like? So thanks to John Claude's leadership there, we are now have pretty much a huge wraparound service on, on the sector and making sure that we're, we're feeling the pulse of where education is going. John Claude, anything you want to say before we wrap up? I'm going to give you guys last last words. No, just really thank you, Dwayne, for helping us organize this. Uh, with your team. Um, and Brett, thank you so much for doing this great work. Um, I mean, I know of your tenure at Automotive High Schools. I know you come from good foundation. So thank you for, for, for doing this work. Brett, any, any last words? No, I just want to thank uh, both Digital Promise and the League of Innovative Schools for providing us this opportunity again to share uh, another pathway to support students through our dual enrollment and Degrees Plus initiatives and just really an honor. And thank you so much for the time. All right, there you have it, folks. Uh, Digital Promise Outlier, conversation on dual enrollment pathways, career pathways. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, continue doing right by students, and we'll see you soon.